Chapter Nineteen of Thou Art the Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thou Art the Man by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Nineteen. Coralie's Journal for Paternal Inspection. My dear aunt has certainly become an altered woman within the last week. She, who was lately calm as a statue, composed, dignified, moving with queen-like motion through life that seemed to have lost all interest for her, now looks like a woman whose every nerve is strung to highest tension, whose delicate frame vibrates with suppressed energy. This sudden change from snow to fire interests me more than I can say. I take as much delight in trying to thread the mystery of this wonderful woman's mind as an enthusiastic pianist can feel in unraveling the web of a Beethoven sonata or a crabbed composition by Sebastian Bach. My whole mind is bent upon finding the secret springs of her action. Those inquiries among the cottagers at Cargill had assuredly something to do with the matter that so absorbs her. Not for nothing would she have been so keenly interested in a casual wayfarer, not for mere charity, were she as charitable as that St. Helena about whom Mr. Coverdale told me some fairy tales yesterday evening across the billiard table. One of the symptoms of this transformation in Lady Penrith is her obvious desire to escape my companionship in her drives. I know you prefer going with the shooters, Cora. On three separate mornings, and thus instigated, I have gone with the shooters for the honourable and reverend john is game worth stocking and he is not so keen a sportsman as the other men indeed no sportsman at all i contrive to enjoy a good deal of his society and i am getting as familiar with the romance of medieval saintliness in rome and in the east as i am with the characters in balzac's novels pleasant as it is however to tramp over brown heather and bracken and to tear my pretty tweed frock among the firs bushes in this enlightening society yet the very fact of her ladyship not wanting me has determined me to force my company upon her so yesterday i met her usual remark about the shooters with a flat refusal I am not going with them ever again, aunt, or, at any rate, not for ages, I answered. I dare say they are tired of me, and I know I am tired of them. All my sympathy is with the innocent birds they massacre, and why should I put myself in the way of having my feelings harrowed? Why, indeed, said my uncle, a remark I might have anticipated from him. I spoke with some soreness of feeling, for in all that tramping over the lumpy moor, and in all those prosy legend, legends of impossible saints, the Reverend John has not committed himself to the faintest expression of admiration for me, the sinner. I am as far from the hope of winning his saintly affections as when I played my first game of billiards with him no aunt no more long days with the guns for me said i if i don't bore you too much i should like to share your drive this afternoon of course you don't bore me cora but my aunt's reluctance expressed itself so strongly in that monosyllable as to attract my uncle's attention he looked at the speaker suddenly with keen, cold eyes. "'No doubt your aunt will be very glad to have you,' he said. "'She must want your society in those dreary drives of hers more than we do.' 
except at luncheon put in reggie mountford a callow subaltern at the grenadiers one of lady penrith's innumerable nephews we should miss you awfully with a lunch cart you say such awfully good things regular rowdy things ah oh, you needn't stare mr coverdale the best things she says go over your head but villars and i are in the know ain't we vill mr villars who might be this flippant brat's grandfather assented with a nod i felt that i had sunk fathoms deep in the estimation of the churchman and i had the pleasure of hearing my uncle's scornful laugh as he rose from the breakfast-table with a muttered my niece is her father's daughter after luncheon lady penrith informed me rather coldly that she was going to ellerslie for a business interview with her land steward and general adviser mr orlebar whom i have heard you speak of not too admiringly she warned me that i would have a very dull afternoon as she might be engaged for a long time i assured her that my delight in seeing the house in which she was born and brought up would make dullness out of the question she was right however i endured an afternoon of inexorable dreariness since the amusement to be found in prowling about a great empty house and trying her ladyship's piano was exhausted in about twenty minutes and then i had nothing to do but roam in the autumnal garden count the chrysanthemums and think over that odious young mountfort's impertinence my regular rowdy speeches forsooth what is the use of having a sharp wit which seizes the ludicrous aspect of everything i fear i have been a little weak in letting him talk of french novels and sensational cases in the divorce court before me and putting in my pert little tongue occasionally but what can one talk of in this end of the country if not sensational cases when every new case goes beyond the old ones in sensational elements there is a feeling in the air as if it were not the end of the century but the end of the world i wandered about solitary and disconsolate thinking only of the unpleasantest things and without so much as a cup of tea whatever the housekeeper was doing she was too busy to think of poor me it was past six o'clock when lady penrith came to me in the drawing-room where i was trying to hammer out one of the mazurkas of chopin's which had been hammered into me at madame michon's and which i now only remember in shreds and patches the arts have not been propitious in my case my musical education was a lamentable failure and i was never able to produce the stiff chalk drawing which every pupil at madame michon's was supposed to execute with the aid of bread-crumbs and a patient master yet i think for mere brains i might pit myself against most of those underbred girls who used to sneer at my shabby frocks lady penrith looked ill and miserable when she re rejoined me after her two hours conversation with her man of business if their talk had been solely of money matters one might suppose her on the brink of ruin but i don't believe financial cares had anything to do with her low spirits she scarcely spoke to me in the drive home and she did not appear at dinner that evening we were informed before dinner that her ladyship was suffering from a neuralgic headache and keeping quiet in her own rooms the maiden aunt lady selina mountford a portentous person in a point lace hood like juliet's nurse had arrived while we were out and i spent a dismal evening in the shadow of her respectability 
and not daring to propose an adjournment to the billiard room although that impertinent young guardsman asked me to join him in a game of pool you can play to me miss urquhart while i work lady selina said curtly with a glance at the open piano thank you i don't play replied i as curtly as she indeed i thought every young lady nowadays was a good pianist there are quite enough of them to make the piano a nuisance but i happen to be an exception i retorted feeling every nerve set on edge by this horrid old woman in a shabby red velvet gown ensconced in the most comfortable chair my own pet chair by the great medieval fireplace where rampant brass lions guard a wrought-iron basket of blazing ship's timber which casts an uncanny green and blue light on people's faces surrounded as we are with coal pits i need hardly mention that it is the correct thing in gentlemen's house houses to burn nothing but logs lady selina settled down to a piece of the ugliest fancy work i ever remember seeing a coarse olive green blanket into which she laboriously dug a huge carpet needle laden with orange worsted it was just such a piece of work as one of the african chief's hundred wives might have chosen for the amusement of her leisure hours altogether hideous and savage perhaps that idea sent my random thoughts in a particular direction this detestable old woman is a mountford i said to myself she must know something about brandon mountford who wrote the african book at any rate there would be some fun in questioning her i think you had an african traveller among your relations some years ago lady selina said i squatting on a stool at her feet as if i loved her most young men travel in africa nowadays she answered it is part of a liberal education a troubled look had come into her face and i could see that she was shuffling with me ah but you must know all about this one a mr brandon mountford who wrote a book of travels do tell me something about him there is nothing to tell except that he was a distant relation of mine and that he died many years ago did he die in africa no oh her manner was so forbidding that i dared not ask another question she dug her skewer into the green surge oh such a bilious colour as if she would like to dig it into me she looked like a witch with the blue and green flames reflected upon her red gown a horrible lurid figure a horrible blue-green face there is evidently some tragic story to be told about brandon mountford some misfortune or even disgrace which involves lady penrith i dare say you know all about it and will grin when you read this diary but when we next meet i shall insist upon your telling me all you know i might question the maid who dresses me and who is most likely to be posted in all scandals affecting the family but i make it a rule of my life never to be confidential with the servants it doesn't pay the poorer one is the more uppish one ought to be this morning lady penrith reappeared none the worse for yesterday's headache after breakfast she informed lady selina that the barouche would be at her disposal for the morning or the afternoon as she might prefer and i would go with her cora is fond of driving she said 
"'But I hope you'll come too, aunt,' said I. "'Not today, Cora. My aunt will excuse me. "'I'm going to see some people beyond Ardliston.' "'But we could drive all that way,' I suggested. "'It would not be worth while. "'I should keep you waiting too long. "'You can take Lady Selina round by Hanborough Point.' Lady Selina protested that she adored the scenery around Colander Castle, so wild, so deliciously bleak and barren, so unlike Berkshire, where she had just been staying with Mrs. Tilbury, St. George, another niece. As the days were growing short, she preferred driving in the morning, she told me, told me off to sit and talk twaddle with this odious spencer who entertained me with an endless web of prosiness about her quarrel with mrs tilbury st george's maid who had waited on her lady selina during her own maid's holiday and had been guilty of various offences against the ancient spinster's dignity and had never brought her morning tea before eight o'clock my niece is a fine horsewoman and hunts four days a week concluded lady selina so one can't be surprised that there is laxity in her household she notices the slightest shortcomings in the stables but permits chaos in her house at luncheon lady penrith looked preoccupied and excited she left the table with an apology before her aunt had finished nibbling a bannock with her cheese and five minutes afterwards i heard her light pony cart drive away more inquiries i suppose and farther afield i was not to be beaten as easily as her ladyship thought i determined on a skirmishing round in the direction of lady penrith beyond ardliston there are two or three poor little villages within a mile or so of that wretched place i might gain upon the carriage by a short cut across the moor and contrive to meet her ladyship in a guileless unpremeditated way those long tramps with the shooters if they have been no other gain to me i have at least enjoyed being a good walker i am in training for twenty miles a day six or seven miles across the moor are nothing to me and then what a blessing to escape from lady selina who had established herself again in my favourite chair by the drawing-room fire by the drawing-room fire olive green tapestry and all en regla not a word said i to this medusa lest she should offer to accompany me for those active busybodyish old women can sometimes walk as well as the youngest i slipped out of the drawing-room found a hat and jacket in the hall and started off at a good four miles an hour across the hills to ardliston where i arrived just in time to see her ladyship's pony carriage disappear over the crest of a further hill in the direction of allen bay on one side of the bay there is a miserable concatenation of fishermen's huts and a churchyard with two old wind-blown firs gaunt and distorted their great bent arms curving inward as if beckoning the dead from the depths of the sea come here and rest in the calm quiet earth they seem to say don't laugh at this dropping into poetry on my part I am only quoting the Reverend John, who showed me a watercolor drawing he had made of the churchyard and fir trees, and confided his sentimental notion about those wind-warped 
branches. He has all the accomplishments. Paints charmingly, fiddles a little, knows Beethoven and Mar Mozart as well as I know Balzac and Dumas, and hangs enraptured over Lady Penrith's piano whenever she condescends to play to us poor creatures in the drawing-room, which is not often. She prefers communicating with the spirit of melancholy in the seclusion of her morning-room. That village over the hill, St. Jude's, is the wretched hole's name, is a good seven miles from Ardliston. It was useless for me to attempt to follow Lady Penrith's carriage. So I crossed the moor again, and walked slowly back, not altogether baffled, for I had at least discovered the direction of her ladyship's drives. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Thou Art the Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thou Art the Man by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 20 The Carpews Have a Border. That village with the old Norman church and the bleak, wind blown churchyard where the graves were sometimes washed by the salt white spray from a stormy sea consisted only of about a half a dozen stone cottages and the congregation which sparsely occupied the old oaken pews on a sunday morning and afternoon was mostly made up of smock frock farmers from the neighbourhood or an occasional pitman's family which had come over the hill to afternoon service for the sake of the walk. Poor as the parish was, and few the dwellings it contained, there were a vicarage and a vicar, the vicarage a low, rambling house with stone walls and slated roof, over which lichens and stone crop had spread a friendly covering, the vicar an elderly careworn man whose shoulders seemed to have bent under the burden of a large family this gentleman with his wife and children were the only people with any pretence to gentility within a longish walk from the norman church and although mrs carpew the vicar's wife had grown worn and wan with domestic cares and rarely enjoyed ten minutes leisure between breakfast and bedtime she had not yet left off lamenting the want of society in the neighbourhood what leisure or entertainment she could have given to society or what gowns she could have worn in society had society been there was a problem which she had never tried to solve she went on lamenting the barrenness of the neighbourhood with a certain ladylike forlornness which secured her the sympathy of friendly farmers wives with whom she occasionally condescended to partake of a substantial north country tea if this poor lady could afford herself one reputable gown and one smart bonnet in which to appear at such homely tea drinkings she thought herself happy for there were three growing girls to be clad and shod and there was an eldest son at durham and a second son at marlborough and two small boys running wild at home whom the vicar was supposed to teach, so that in the long vacation, very long seemed that vacation to the house-mother, there were seven hungry mouths round the vicarage table, to say nothing of the father and mother, who almost lost all appetite and horror at the amount of food these seven hungry maws consumed. "'A little more beef, please, ma. A little more pudding, please, ma what a chorus it was mrs carpew had much need to comfort herself with the vulgar aphorism that it is better to pay butcher and baker than doctor and chemist but that consolatory reflection did not tend to make the bills lower 
if it wasn't for their border the carpews would never be able to make both ends meet said the farmers wives who knew how poor a living this parish of st jude's provided for its pastor there was a boarder at the vicarage a mysterious gentleman boarder whose face but few of the neighbours had ever beheld but whose existence in the house was not made an absolute secret although it was talked about as little as possible it is beneath your father's position as vicar for us to have a boarder so the less you say about him the better dears mrs carpew told her brood he is a poor afflicted creature and it is a charity to take care of him the young carpews were so far of the world worldly as to be able to act upon this maternal counsel the words border and afflicted were equally hateful to them and never passed their lips affliction in that sense meant to their young minds something revolting and horrible to look upon and they would have walked miles to avoid meeting the boarder who lived under the same roof with them all that these younger members of the family knew of the unseen occupant was that he lived in a portion of the house that had been added by a former vicar a man of sporting tastes and of larger means than the present incumbent a squire's son from the lake district whose father owned a good deal of property near keswick and who could afford to indulge himself with a kennel of shooting dogs a well-filled gun-room and as many jovial bachelor friends as he cared to entertain in the shooting season altogether a very different type of man from ebenezer carpew who had struggled out of the dismal swamp of nonconformity into the loftier atmosphere of the church of england via durham and who had never recovered from the effects of the struggle the wing added to the vicarage early in the century by the bachelor parson consisted of four good-sized rooms affording ample accommodation for an afflicted gentleman even if he were as the neighbors insisted a sprig of nobility four rooms locked off from the rest of the house were reserved for the unknown and it was the popular idea that the unknown was not right in his mind and had been confided to mr carpew's care by his relatives not right but not so wrong as to render his residence in the in mr carpew's house illegal st jude's vicarage was so remote from civilization such a lonely and isolated nook along that bleak cumbrian coast that questions which might have been asked in any other neighborhood were not asked here the village of st jude was less than a mile from allen bay and while prosecuting her inquiries among the little group of fishermen's cottages clustered on one side of the bay lady penrith heard of the mysterious inmate of st jude's vicarage but beyond the mere fact of his existence her informant could tell her nothing nobody ever sees him said a fisherman's wife who was aunt to the servant girl at the vicarage mr and mrs carpew wait on him themselves the girl told me take him his food and clean up his room and look after him they're too poor to keep a servant on purpose and the girl it was my own niece mary martin she was over two years at the vicarage and never see him all that time said mrs carpew told her that she was to hold her tongue and say nothing about him to nobody and she didn't except to me and two or three others as she'd known from a baby what kind of man is mr carpew lady penrith asked thoughtfully well your ladyship he's what i would call a poor creature there's no grit in him he's regular broke down with trouble and care all those hungry boys and girls to feed always in debt to the butcher or baker they say the livin ain't worth more than a hundred and seventy pounds a year all told and there's nine in their family the youngsters all growing up hardy and a servant girl makes ten poor mrs carpew works her fingers to the bone sewing and helping with the housework 
if ever there was a white slave she's one poor lady but i think she's got more spirit than the vicar and bears up better just nobody help them the farmers wives they helps a bit with a couple of chickens now and then or a pound or two of butter and a score of eggs but it don't go far there's no gentry near enough to take any interest in they're not like regular poor folks you see my lady they can't ask for help or else i dare say they would have asked up the castle for it was the old lord who gave mr carpew the living such as it is his lordship's father that must have been a long time ago yes my lady it must be nigh upon five-and-twenty years mr carpew was tutor at the castle before lord ardliston and his brother went to college ah he used to have fine times then poor gentleman his back was straight enough in these days and he was quite smart in his dress and held himself ever so high life was almost a pleasure for him then he used to racket about at all the race meetings in the neighbourhood with the young lord and his brother he's not as old a man as you'd think looking at him now and i don't believe he's more than six or seven years older than lord penrith and they were good friends no doubt he and his pupils ah yes they was very good friends him and mr urquhart in particular his lordship was always high my lady even when he was lord ardliston but mr urquhart he allus made more free with folks and he and mr carpew was a good deal about together they say the vicar was a great scholar in those days he'd been helped on at college because of his talents and people said the earl was lucky to find a man in the neighbourhood ready to his hand mr carpew's father was a dissenting minister at workington a small tradesman that had taken to preaching in a little chapter chapel up a back lane so you may suppose it wasn't no easy matter for him to send his son to durham college how long has the person your niece spoke about been at the vicarage asked lady penrith after a thoughtful silence ah that's more than i can say my lady i don't suppose any one knows when he came here or that any one see him come but he's been there a long while twenty years i can't say my lady it's four years or more since mary told me about him and she was at the vicarage going on for three years and he was there all the time though she never laid eyes on him and that's all i know do you think there is any one here or at st jude's who knows more about him no i don't my lady for we've talked it over among ourselves here and up at st jude's and if there'd been anything more to hear i should have heard it they've kept it all very close the carpews have but we all know that if the vicar didn't get a little money behind his wage as parson him and hisn must have been famished when coralie saw the pony carriage disappear over the crest of the hill lady penrith was on her way to st jude's to make a formal call at the vicarage that seemed the simplest manner of approaching the carpew mystery in the first place and she put a strain upon herself to suppress all signs of agitation and to appear with the manner of a person interested only in the case of possible distress the mysterious message delivered to her on the moor was a sufficient excuse for pushing her inquiries to the furthest limits and as the wife of the patron of the living she was at least entitled to respect from the vicar and his family indeed her conscience smote her at the thought that she had been living within a dozen miles of genteel poverty such as this and had done nothing to brighten these poor people's lives her first attempt was baffled by mrs carpew's abject terror of being discovered in her untidy parlour and her worse than shabby gown the iceland ponies 
neat little cart and smart groom had been visible to the vicar's wife from the windows of her bedroom where she had been engaged the whole afternoon in a favourite species of occupation which she called a good turnout, which involved the emptying of drawers and closets old trunks and old bandboxes and piling up the shabby raiment on the bed a proceeding lengthened by the minutest inv investigation of said raiment and much discussion with her eldest daughter now old enough to be admitted to the strictly feminine rights of the turnout as to the possible rehabilitation of certain garments which had been put by as hopeless or the conversion of last year's finery to this year's fashion the fashion as known at st jude's which was two years behind london and fifteen months behind edinburgh from an open window mother and daughter saw the penrith pony carriage approaching it's lady penrith cried miss carpew i saw her driving those ponies the last time i was at ardliston to think of her coming to call on us after all these years and we not fit to be seen do be quick ma and wash your face and smooth your hair you look dreadful and so do i glancing at her own heated countenance in the cloudy glass on the littered dressing-table gertrude we can't see her exclaimed mrs carpew it's out of the question the boys are in the drawing-room i looked in just before i came upstairs luke and jack were playing double dummy and joe was washing snapper in a tub by the fire he will wash that dog in the drawing-room run down to sarah and say not at home it seems a pity faltered gertrude lingering on the threshold if we say not at home to-day she may never come again and she may have come to ask us to a party not she what after her being at the castle off and on nearly ten years she's only come to bother about some of the poor people i dare say perhaps to complain of something to find fault with your father for not going to see them when they're ill miles and miles on a winter night run gertie this instant cried the vicar's wife almost hysterically as the grinding of the wheels drew near upon the hard chalk road as if he could go out on cold nights with his asthma concluded mrs carpew grumbling to the empty air gertrude rushed downstairs three steps at a time after her manner and reached the kitchen passage just as the groom rang the bell not at home nobody at home she gasped to the maid of all work wipe your face as you go along the passage do for goodness sake it's all over blacks gertie dropped into a chair by the fire as the girl hurried out scrubbing her dirty face with an apron as dirty and burst into tears how horrid it all is she moaned to be obliged to hide from well-dressed people as if one was a murderer i wish i was in one of the colonies where there are no fine ladies no pony carriages nothing to be little one and make one feel wretched i wish i was dead or married to steve maltby stephen maltby was the son of a small tenant farmer whose comfortable homestead mrs carpew visited condescendingly and whose honourable advances to miss carpew had been flouted by her parents if you want to sink into the class out of which i raised myself by the most strenuous toil you had better marry stephen maltby said the vicar severely gertrude felt in her heart of hearts that she had better marry stephen without any retrospective considerations but she submitted as a dutiful daughter stephen was tall and good-looking but his hair was decidedly sandy 
and she was not so much in love with him as to defy father and mother for his sake so she told herself that wretched as life was at the vicarage she did not want to lose caste and to sink to the level of a tenant farmer's wife she heard the hall door shut and the slow slipshod feet of sarah returning along the passage the vicarage spread itself over a good deal of ground and the drawing-room where the vicar's sons were playing whist was at some distance from these rooms which the sporting vicar of fifty years before had built on the east side of the house abutting on a walled garden of about an acre this garden with its fir trees and shrubberied walk on one side and its old apple trees rose bushes and asparagus beds on the other had been the pleasure and the pride of the previous vicar and his wife but mrs carpew was too harassed and hard driven by the stress of daily life to take any pride in anything and mr carpew seemed to have lost all interest in life except a feeble concern as to what horse was likely to win any great race a subject he would discuss with his sons or his neighbours with a faint revival of human feeling for the rest he was like a man whose spirit had gone out of him years before who only moved about automatically a mindless nerveless body what did she say asked gertie meeting sarah at the kitchen door she seemed regular put out when i told her there wasn't nobody at home she f asked first for the vicar and then for the missus and then if there were any member of the family as she could see and i says no you was every one of you out and then she asked when master and missus was likely to be at home and i says to-morrow afternoon for i thinks i if missus knows beforehand she can read up things a bit yes yes of course that was very sensible of you sarah and then she says she will come to-morrow at about three o'clock so now you know what you got to do miss gertrude and there mustn't be no washing dogs in the drawing-room no nor yet those horrid cards as if the evening wasn't long enough for whist when they can have me and lillian instead of double dummy lady penrith must have made up her mind to know us mused the vicar's daughter as she ran up to her garret bedroom to take a last look at her ladyship's pony cart perhaps she has heard how hard it is for us to live here without society and means to be our friend she opened her lattice and put her head out into the autumn wind there was no sign of the pony cart not even a cloud of dust in the direction where she had first looked and then sweeping the landscape her eyes descried groom and ponies stationed a little way off in the opposite direction eastward toward the scottish border and behold the pony cart was empty gertie ran to another dormer at the east end of the house which commanded garden and common land beyond and from this lookout she beheld lady penrith standing far off on the steep heather-clad slope which rose outside the garden wall evidently looking at the house and its surroundings gertie watched her for ten minutes or so and saw her walking slowly about the hillside and looking from time to time at the vicarage while gertie fearful of being seen at her post of observation screened herself behind the faded chintz curtain end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of thou art the man this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org thou art the man by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty one coralie's private journal 
It is three days since I sent my father the latest chapter in my critical and exhaustive study of Lady Penrith, and I really thought I had done my work so carefully and so well as to deserve praise even from him. But not one word of acknowledgment have I yet received, and if I had not taken the trouble to register my little packet, I might think that my manuscript had gone astray. I have guarded against even this contingency, for in the copy I made for paternal perusal, I used ciphers instead of proper names, enclosing a key to those ciphers in a separate letter. My original journal I keep for my own amusement in days to come, when my life at Calander Castle will be but a memory, a memory to prose about, perhaps, to girls who will be as tired of me as I am of Lady Selina and her rambling stories of her innumerable nieces and their splendors. My sisters all married well, and I might have married as well as any of them, she explained to me yesterday. The newspaper people used to write about us as the beautiful Mountforts, and at my age I needn't mind saying that, though I was the eldest, I was by no means the plainest of the sisters. Indeed, she needn't mind, for there isn't a trace of that youthful beauty left in her wrinkled old countenance, so she might as well prate of the conquests of the Lady Selina of those days without being accused of egotism. I was home an hour earlier than Lady Penrith the day before yesterday, and I had the felicity of pouring out Lady Selina's tea, a burden which was somewhat relieved by the Reverend John's appearance in the drawing-room. He had left the shooters on the moors. "'You are tired of killing innocent birds, I suppose,' said I. "'No more tired than you are of eating them, Miss Urquhart,' he answered. "'This was rather crushing, as he had seen me demolish the best part of a cold grouse at breakfast that morning. "'Oh, I am strictly utilitarian there,' answered I. "'When once they are killed, they may as well be eaten. He looked around the room with a disappointed air, I thought. What has become of Lady Penrith? Not another headache, I hope, he said. There was not nearly so much of talk of headache when I was a young woman, said Lady Selina. I explained that my aunt had gone for a long, solitary drive, and then, with my own hands, I carried that starched parson his cup of tea after I had put a sweet little vernimatin table by the side of his chair. I pampered him with cream and muffin until the primly pious creature looked up with a chilly smile and said, If I were a Mussulman, this will be my idea of paradise, Miss Urquhart. A low, easy chair and a nice young lady to give me my tea. Yes, and when you missed Lady Penrith just now, you looked round the room as though it were a blank, said I. Would you believe it, my dear Letts? The creature blushed to the roots of his nice wavy hair, like an iceberg crimsoned by the setting sun. Lady Penrith's absence must leave a blank, "'Wherever people are accustomed to see her,' he answered as the blush faded, "'leaving him in his usual iced cucumber condition. "'Trying to please a man of his temperament is like punishment labor, "'the hardest form of human toil, with the conviction that it is all wasted effort.' Yes, I think I would sooner turn the crank than to try to fascinate the Reverend and Honourable John. Yet plain women have achieved even greater successes. I know of plain peeresses who had 
no money-bags counterbalance blunt features and dull complexions plain millionairesses who have married millionaires on the strength of being plump and comfortable-looking let me remember this and go on trying after all i have nothing else to do in this fortress on the marches except to watch lady penrith and it is in a woman's nature especially a plain woman's to try hard for any great catch in the matrimonial line that circumstances may throw in her way circumstances have thrown mr coverdale in my way and i should be a fool not to do my uttermost to improve the occasion no more rowdy talk in the billiard-room i feel angry with my father for having told me so much of the club smoke-room slang he never told me anything really bad but just those touch-and-go stories that give zest to conversation among men and women of the world yet which of a are of a kind to disgust this high church puritan i shall devote to-morrow morning to fishing out biographies of the saints in the encyclopedia and in the evening i'll read newman's apologia or montan labert's monks of the west the mystery thickens to you only dear lads could i confide my adventures of this afternoon it has been a day of surprises the first occurred at the breakfast-table when lady penrith who was generally reticence itself about her own doings thoughts and fancies and who rarely initiates any conversations with my uncle began to talk to him about her drive of yesterday i took the icelanders further than usual she said but they did their work capitally they are dear little things and i am very much obliged to you penrith the iceland ponies are a recent present from my lord to my lady a kind of set-off against the thousand or so of her money which he paid for the hire of a grouse moor in argyllshire i'm glad you like them answered that human iceberg curious to find two such men as my uncle penrith and mr coverdale under one roof yet they wear their ice with a difference i suspect the parson of hidden fires but i believe his lordship frozen to the core i went as far as st jude's i wanted very much to see the vicar's wife i have heard a saddening account of their poverty however there was no one at home so i had my drive for nothing her manner of watching her husband's face as she said this convinced me that there was some serious motive for her speech and that she was trying the effect of a certain illusions upon his lordship it was a pity you gave yourself the trouble he answered care carelessly the vicar of st jude's is no poorer than a hundred other parish priests scattered about the country in villages as solitary and wretched the living is yours i am told oh, well, the living is mine but i can't make it any better than it is carpew was very glad to get it when my father gave it to him he hoped it was only the beginning i suppose he could hardly think it would be the end i believe it's his own fault that he's still at st jude's he's a lazy vagabond who would rather vegetate than work he shirked all trouble i remember when he was my tutor though he came to us with a great reputation for mathematics he was always glad to do as little work as possible and hubert and i would have preferred doing none so we were good friends he and hubert were tremendous chums indeed for hubert always liked low company low company a famous mathematician exclaimed my aunt mathematics won't turn a cad into a gentleman 
answered my uncle, lifting his eyebrows. His people were small shopkeepers, primitive Methodists, or something of that kind. The poor wretch had struggled out of the mire, and now he supposed he has slipped back into it. I have not seen him, to my knowledge, for the last ten years. "'Do you know anything about his wife?' asked my aunt, still watchful of her husband's face. "'I remember hearing that she was the daughter of an adjutant of a line regiment, and by way of being immensely genteel. Poor creature! Her gentility must have rusted and mildewed in twenty years at St. Jude's. "'Have the Carpews been twenty years at St. Jude's? More than twenty. My father gave him the living before Cora was born. I rem remember my brother begging the birth for him, and it was before Hubert's marriage. Now this was one of the longest conversations I ever heard between this lady and gentleman. They are always civil to each other before company, courteous, courteous even, but it is the rarest thing for them to talk to each other as though they had an interest in common. After luncheon, Lady Penrith again informed me that she was going for a long drive alone, and suggested the barouche for her aunt and me. I was spared that infliction, as Lady Selina had acquired a fine cold in the head, one of those colds which inflict keener suffering upon the spectator than upon the patient, and which I believe to be distinctly infectious whatever doctors may say to the contrary. As she insisted on nursing this loathsome complaint by the drawing-room fire, I deserted that room for the afternoon, and started for a long walk, first with the idea of getting a glimpse of her ladyship's Icelanders going or returning, and secondly because the fresh air and exercise will help me maintain at least a clear complexion, if not a beautiful one. Now, my good let's, comes surprise number two. I walked across the moor to Ardliston, and in the long, straggling street of that bleak, wind-blown village, whom should I meet but my very own father? Yes, my father, who has always expressed his hatred of this part of the world, and has congratulated himself that while his brother was born at the castle, Barclay Square had been thought good enough for him, the younger son, so that he was not called upon to feel any affection for Cumberland as his native soil. There, in front of the Higginson's arms, whom should I see but that very father of mine? He did not seem particularly pleased to see me, Indeed, I may say that his manner was strictly paternal. Come inside, Coralie. I want a few minutes' talk with you, said he after his first curt greeting, and then he led the way into the inn, hotel forsooth on the sideboard, and into a wretched parlor where the decorations comprised a magenta table cover that hurt my eyes after the cool, harmonious tints of autumnal sea and sky, a pair of cut glass lusters on the mantelpiece, and a fearful and wonderful composition in gaudily colored shells under a glass shade on the sideboard. There isn't a chair in the room fit to sit in, said my father with a vindictive shove to an American cloth covered monstrosity, into which he flung himself, leaving me to perch where I liked. Are you here for long? I asked. No, possibly not more than twenty-four hours. Oh, you received my manuscript, I suppose. Oh, yes, that came to hand. You have the pen of a ready writer, Cora. You ought to do something in literature by and by. And my manuscript brought you here, I suppose, said I, ignoring the paternal praise. He did not condescend to answer. Lady Penrith drew drove through the place half an hour ago. Do you know where she is going? he asked presently. I have a shrewd suspicion, said I, and then I told him of the conversation at the breakfast table, 
watching his face meanwhile as keenly as miss lady penrith watched her husband whether my father is less master of himself than the earl or whether he had more reason to be concerned i know not but his countenance betrayed intense anxiety he started out of the odious sticky chair and walked to the window where he stood looking into the street for some minutes curious this sudden interest in the car pews said he after a long silence and with a very poor attempt at careless speech i should have given my father credit for being a better actor but i fear that pegs and late hours are beginning to tell upon him he has aged considerably since i left school and looks older than my uncle penrith yes it is rather curious ain't it i answered i believe it springs from her insane anxiety to trace that wretched lunatic who accosted her on the moor can you conceive any reason for this interest in a half-witted peasant yes the strongest of all reasons he answered bitterly she is a woman and women love to make molehills into mountains now listen to me cora i am here on business business of importance you can understand that as you know i loathe the place and am ill friends with my brother not a word about your having seen me here to any living creature gentle or simple i shall vanish as soon and suddenly as i came last night's mail brought me to-night's mail may probably take me back to london go on with your journal it is capital practice for your pen you are cultivating exactly that pert pessimism which readers like nowadays the task is so good for you as a literary exercise that i won't even thank you for doing it indeed you ought to thank me for putting it upon you to do bravo cried i that's an easy way of escaping the sense of obligation uh, go on with your journal keep a strict watch upon her ladyship don't be afraid of being diffuse note the smallest details and send me your report every day or twice a day if there's something interesting to report there can be no further doubt as to my position said i this is secret police work it is work that may save your father from a great danger and you from the risk of the disadvantages that his disgrace must entail upon you answered my father sternly i won't trifle you any longer coralie this is a matter of life and death life or death to reputation i mean he was almost livid and his lower lip worked in an agitated way when he left off speaking there must be something very serious behind this anxiety i saw him wipe the beads of perspiration from his forehead though the room with its wretched turf fire felt damp and chilly there must be something very serious in my father's past history something which very nearly touches lady penrith i am devoured with curiosity yet dare not ask questions of any one about the past lest i excite suspicion and injure him he is my father after all and as he tells me any discredit to him must reflect on discredit discredit to me i must be loyal to him however disloyal i may be to my uncle's wife and now cora it's good-bye to you said my father after booking uh, looking out the window again for some minutes you'd better get on with your walk 
there's not a mortal in sight and you can slip out of the house without anyone knowing that you've been here the parlor was close to the inn door he had just touched my forehead with his hot dry lips and put me across the threshold one o'clock this habit of diary writing grows upon me and i am shortening my hours of rest but what is the use of beauty sleep when one has no beauty end of chapter twenty one Chapter twenty two of Thou Art the Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thou Art the Man by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter twenty two. So we but meet, not part again. Mrs. Carpew and her daughter toiled all the morning in the expectation of their aristocratic visitor. They could have very little help from Sarah, the maid of all work, who had her hands full with everyday work of the family, scrubbing floors, peeling potatoes, making beds, carrying water, cooking the poor little bit of meat that had to be eked out with so much plain pudding and home-grown vegetables all sarah could do in the cleaning of the drawing-room was to come with her worn-out carpet-room and sweep raising such a mighty dust in the process that it might have seemed almost wiser not to sweep when sarah had swept mrs carpew and her daughter began to tidy and tidying the vicarage drawing-room was a work that ought to have ranked almost as high as the labours of hercules the mother went about the business in a desultory way, murmuring complaints against fate and her own children as she worked. Were there ever such untidy boys, cards here, dominoes there, pipes everywhere, and such pipes? It made her sick to touch them. What would her mother, whose drawing-room, under the difficulties of barrack life, was always refined and artistic? think if she could see such a room as this but then my mother only had me said mrs carpew well mother i suppose you'd hardly like to see all of us reduced to one girl said gertrude as who was working briskly and steadily cleaning corners polishing the shabby old chippendale chairs that the vicar had bought cheap at a farmhouse auction going for a mere song because of their old-fashioned shape before anybody in that remote world knew that such chairs were a thing of beauty shaking the dust out of the window curtains bringing the black clad brush and giving an extra polish to the old iron grate gertrude stopped at nothing that could improve the aspect of that shabby old room but it really don't see much good doing anything else one could whitewash the ceiling and repaper the walls she said looking round despondingly after nearly two hours hard work that odious paper was a triumph of ugliness to begin with and dirt hasn't improved it mother and daughter dined sketchily at one o'clock with the depressed father and the hungry lads and lasses who reduced the shoulder of mutton to so bare a bone that it promised badly for a grill for the vicar's breakfast especially if sarah is to dine of it remarked discontentedly mrs carpew reassured him sarah was dining on a dumpling any scraps of meat served to make sarah a dumpling the younger girls were excited at the idea of lady penrith's visit shall we see her asked lillian who came next to gertrude but was not considered out certainly not replied gertie look at your frock positively disgraceful shall we see her ma repeated lillian scorning the sisterly reply 
of course not you and ethel have treated those nice alpacas shamefully they were never nice grumbled ethel they are the most hideous frocks you could have chosen what is all this about lady penrith asked the vicar looking up from his plate to join in the family talk which he usually ignored is she coming here yes at three o'clock this afternoon what for why to pay us a visit of course i dare say she has heard that gertrude is growing up and sympathizes with our want of society gertrude has society enough when she is marching about the place with stephen maltby grumbled the vicar society forsooth i'd swap the best society in cumberland for a five-pound note the sons laughed the daughters sat in dumb disgust they had inherited all their mother's longings and regrets and had heard thrilling stories of the gaiety of garrison towns regimental dances archery meetings a brilliant world in which their mother's girlhood had been spent a dazzling sphere inaccessible for them gertrude would have sacrificed five years of her life for one garrison ball if mephistopheles had offered the opportunity i can't understand lady penrith coming to this house said the vicar with a troubled look she cannot want nothing here but to pry and to spy i suppose you can't conceive of the possibility of her wanting to see ma and me retorted his eldest daughter haughtily no i can't answered the vicar with paternal candour dinner concluded under a cloud but not much heavier a cloud than usually enveloped the family meal for there was seldom a dinner that went from start to finish without trouble of some kind trouble about underdone meat or overdone meat watery vegetables cold gravy trouble about insolent rejoinders from the boys possibly not meant to be insolent mrs carpew insisted that in meaning they were as doves which provoked the father's wrath trouble trouble boiled and bubbled every day in the cauldron of life at st jude's vicarage to-day gertrude sacrificed her share in the sloppy rice pudding in order to make her toilette in good time for the expected visit and at a quarter to three mrs carpew and daughter were seated in the drawing-room employed in some genteelly useless needlework and trying to look as though they sat there every afternoon the odour of dogs and tobacco had been subjugated by widely opened windows and the room was really tidy sarah had been instructed as to the bringing of the afternoon tea and urged to serve it with more style than she had ever done for the farmers wives suppose she doesn't come after all our trouble speculated gertie watching the road from the low bow window i couldn't suppose her guilty of anything so unladylike oh well i don't know it would be just like our luck if she didn't turn up after all oh there she comes i can see those heavenly ponies dear little things i wonder if sarah has come downstairs gertrude ran to the kitchen to assure herself yes sarah was there dressed as she was rarely dressed at that hour in her sunday stuff gown clean apron and cap and the tea-tray was ready on the kitchen table and there were tea-cakes baking she's coming look sharp sarah said gertie and then flew back to the drawing-room and took up her cruel work once more lady penrith announced the maid of all work how handsome how graceful in form and movement how simply dressed gertie wondered at the plain cloth gown whose only merit was the perfection with which the severely cut bodice fitted the finely proportioned figure 
only a rough brown cloth this mistress of many thousands a year was more plainly attired than a farmer's wife in her sunday gown but gertie felt instinctively that the cloth gown and neat little felt hat were just the right things for a country drive on a dull autumn day and she had the felicity later of seeing and even handling the long sealskin coat which her ladyship had left in the hall this is quite too kind of you dear lady penrith exclaimed mrs carpew with a reminiscence of garrison manners it is such a pleasure to my daughter and me to become acquainted with you personally after hearing your praises so perpetually you are very good and i am very glad to know you and miss carpew sibyl replied graciously and then with an earnest look and grave voice she continued i must not sail under false colours i had a very serious purpose in coming here to-day a bazaar thought the vicar's wife and she wants us to work for it just like these fine ladies they never take any one up without a motive mrs carpew was quite willing to be taken up if the price to be paid were not too high i want to enlist your sympathy for myself and for one who is very dear to me and who is i have reason to believe a dweller under this roof mrs carpew started flushed and then slowly paled i don't understand you don't understand the link between me and the unfortunate gentleman who lives under your charge said sibyl looking intently into the weak commonplace countenance pray be frank with me how long has he been with you mrs carpew hesitated stammered in an inaudible word or two in evident distress i really don't know she faltered after that embarrassed pause i can't tell you anything about him he's in my husband's care i i never interfere the vicar took him in from benevolent motives i believe to oblige an old friend of course we are paid something for his maintenance we are too poor to dispense with payment but not nearly so much as would have to be paid anywhere else to oblige an old friend repeated sibyl yes that is just as i thought but think now mrs carpew you must remember how long he has been here indeed lady penrith i do not one year is so like another in this dull place but surely you can fix the date of an important event like that a stranger coming under your roof and then you have a living calendar in your children their ages would tell you i remember ma interjected gertrude who had listened with keenest curiosity who rushed into the conversation unconscious of her mother's frowns it was the year that bobby was born you hadn't left your room he was a tiny tiny baby and one day old nurse bond told me there had been a fine to-do and two gentlemen had arrived early in the morning they must have come by sea she thought for one of them was wet through and his coat dripped sea-water he wasn't right in his mind and he was to stay it was a stormy morning suggested sibyl yes it was a stormy morning nurse bond had to light a fire and get dry clothes for the gentleman who stayed she told me all about it when she came to the nursery at breakfast time added gertrude eagerly and then for the first time became aware of her mother's warning scowl 
what had she done mischief perhaps she had been expressly forbidden to talk of the mysterious border her mother's white face and distracted look smote her with sudden terror mrs carpew i appeal to you as woman to woman said sibyl with clasped hands and a voice that thrilled both listeners with such depth of earnestness in its tone let me see this person he may not be the person i think but if he is i would sacrifice half my fortune to look upon his face again and to give him help and comfort in his affliction you shall be no losers you and your husband for doing me that kindness you shall indeed be greatly the gainers you know that i am rich and you may suppose i would not count the cost where where my affection was concerned i firmly believe that the person in your care is a kinsman of mine one whom i loved years ago before lord penrith asked me to be his wife i am quite frank with you i keep nothing back from you or from your daughter for i can see that she sympathizes with me indeed i do interjected gertrude and i don't think you can refuse me your sympathy let me see him if only for five minutes and then among us all the vicar and you and i we may arrange some plan for making his life happier only let me see him let me be sure he is the man i am looking for what could possibly make you suppose that he is your relation lady penrith mrs carpew asked her countenance expressing a conflict of ideas in a brain that afforded very little room for struggle a letter in his own hand a letter how could he have sent a letter he has not written to anybody for years he has no messenger he has written to me he has found a messenger answered sibyl out of the depths out of the depths she repeated to herself woman for god's sake show that you have a woman's heart she cried passionately losing all patience with the flabby creature before her yes ma do if you have any more feeling in you than a bran pincushion put in gertie indignantly it is such a small thing that i am asking only to see him for a few minutes the tears were streaming down sibyl's pale cheeks gertrude with difficulty refrained from hitting her mother it is not a small thing it is a very big thing no one is allowed to see him not even my own children i appeal to gertrude don't appeal to me i hate you cried her rebellious daughter if i wished ever so and indeed dear lady penrith i do sympathize with you i couldn't let you see him that part of the house he has quite the best rooms in the vicarage is locked off and the vicar keeps the key it would be impossible if i ever wished ever so and i do wish for gracious sakes don't go on rambling like that cried gertie you can ask pa i suppose if he does keep the door locked he can give you the key he's not a bluebeard yes yes i can ask him faltered mrs carpew as if catching at an escape from present perplexity i will ask him lady penrith you may be sure i will do all in my power to accomplish what you wish but indeed i believe you are laboring under a delusion in the first place our poor friend could not possibly have communicated with you i tell you he has communicated with me 
mrs carpew for pity's sake don't beat about the bush you say you will ask your husband go and ask him or bring him here and let me plead my own cause i feel assured he will hear reason he is out answered mrs carpew are you sure of that quite sure i saw him go out half an hour ago the latter part of the speech was a falsehood mrs carpew had seen her husband creeping past the bow window with furtive glances at the occupants only five minutes before and she knew that the vicar had been in her own domestic language on the listen the vicar might be on the listen still perhaps outside the drawing-room door in any case it would not do for his wife to compromise him there must be time for consideration she hoped that she would see his way to serving lady penrith rather than that other person who rewarded them so scantily for watchful care and service she hoped but she felt that extreme caution was necessary upon her part how long will he be out asked sibyl impatiently i can wait he is so very uncertain answered mrs carpew with a warning look at her daughter he may be away for hours this is such an immense parish so poor and so few people but stretching over such a lot of ground he may have gone to one of the furthest farmhouses and he is a slow walker at this point the tea-tray bumped against the door which was opened rather awkwardly by the bearer of the tray sarah sailed in and began to spread out a very smart tea-cloth an unsold item of a sale of work for parochial purposes which had lapsed as a perquisite to the vicar's wife i will wait said lady penrith perhaps you would kindly put up my ponies for an hour or so i am so sorry apologized mrs carpew we only have a two-stall stable and we as we keep no conveyance the boys have filled both stalls with their rabbit hutches and the stable smells uh, too dreadful ejaculated gertie never mind i see the groom has put their rugs on said lady penrith who had been looking out the window and they are very hardy i should like to wait for the vicar's return mrs carpew if i am not in your way in my way dear lady penrith how can you suggest such a thing exclaimed the vicar's wife her garrison manner struggling with mental agonies gertrude who had heard that it was the right thing for the daughter of the house to pour out the tea had seated herself at the tray a position she was wont to seize on state occasions in defiance of her mother i'll slip out and inquire if the vicar has left word where he has gone said mrs carpew making for the door perhaps he may not have gone to any of his distant parishioners after all she had disappeared from the drawing-room before any one could reply she hurried along the passage looked into the vicar's den it was empty she crossed a lobby went up three steps and knocked at the door which divided the new wing from the original building it was an additional door which had been put there within the last ten years a heavy door covered with green baize shutting with a steel spring she knocked twice before the door was opened by the vicar himself well has she gone no she is waiting for you oh there has been such a scene i feel so sorry for her and then standing just within the green baize door mrs carpew related her conversation with lady penrith cream and sugar inquired gertrude smiling across the table at her guest as she poured out the tea sibyl was too agitated to answer the trivial question now we are alone let me thank you for your sympathy she said i know you are a warm kind-hearted girl and if you will help me as i feel sure you can you will find that i am not ungrateful you well you shall have something better than rabbits in your stable oh oh please don't think me mercenary don't think i am influenced by the idea of your money or your rank indeed i am not so paltry-minded as that lady penrith i should be just as sorry for you 
if you were just as poor as ma and pa but i'm afraid there's nothing i can do to help you nor ma either ma is the most helpless person i know she's just under pa's thumb if he were to tell her to shut us all up in the attic and feed us on bread and water she would do it she'd be very sorry for us and she'd go about the house crying all day but she'd give way to pa she hasn't any backbone that's what stephen says of her no backbone stephen is your sweetheart perhaps speculated sibyl he wants to be but he's not allowed his people are only small tenant farmers like the martins in miss austen's emma and pa and ma say i should lose caste of course i don't want to lose caste but the maltbys are ever so much better off than we are and live in a sweet old house and keep a gardener and a boy to look after the stable and a white chapel cart and have everything about them as neat as a new pen and here everything is wretched and pa is trying enough to break the spirit of the whole family sad and agitated as she was lady penrith could not refrain from a faint smile at the idea of mrs carpew's daughter losing caste by marrying a farmer i don't want to suggest disobedience miss carpew but if this mr maltby is a good man i think your father should reconsider his decision he is good as good as gold but please don't think i care much about him well you will give me your confidence another day perhaps when i am happier and now tell me have you never seen the gentleman who lives in those shut-off rooms never that's very strange surely he goes out into the air sometimes if not every day i believe he sometimes walks in the garden at the east end of the house a walled garden with a row of fir trees inside the wall we can't see into it from any of our windows no as strange as it may seem i have never seen him he might be the man in the iron mask for anything i know about him mrs carpew reappeared at this moment and informed lady penrith with polite regrets that the vicar had gone out an hour ago and that he had left word that he might not be home until late in the evening he had gone to one of the furthest cottages in his parish then you think there would be no use in my waiting for him said sibyl no use delightful as it is to gertrude and me to see you here but i hope you'll at least stop for a second cup of tea thank you no i have a long drive home i'm very glad to have made your acquaintance and your daughters but i must see the vicar without an hour's avoidable delay will you ask him to be kind enough to stop at home to-morrow morning i will drive here directly after breakfast i am sure he'll be charmed to see you and willing to grant my request i hope i shall think it very strange if he refuses said lady penrith with a touch of sternness i think you rather overdid it ma said gertie as the visitor had been escorted to her carriage and had driven away what do you mean miss by overdoing about pa in the furthest cottage it's very odd if lady penrith didn't see him walk past the window while she was talking end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of thou art the man this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. thou art the man by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty three fancies that might be facts that are lady penrith 
was again missing at afternoon tea, and again John Coverdale looked round the drawing-room with a countenance expressive of blank disappointment. He had not been with the shooters who had just returned, and to her having a substantial egg and toast tea in the breakfast room, he came to the drawing room from a long afternoon's reading in the almost unused library. A spacious apartment which had once been an armory and in which three great carved oak bookcases filled with eighteenth century literature books which no one ever looked at represented culture at killander castle he came for rest and relaxation in society which was always delightful to him and missing that one gracious figure in his survey of the drawing-room his disappointment was no less obvious than it had been yesterday coralie looked at him sharply with her bright grey eyes she was beginning to entertain very unpleasant suspicions about mr coverdale no she hasn't come home from her solitary drive she said answering his look my aunt is getting quite dissipated ain't she those ponies are spoiling her orderly habits she ought not to be out after five o'clock on such an afternoon as this remarked lady selina i don't understand this passion for long drives i have no doubt lady penrith has gone on some kindly errand protested mr coverdale seating himself near the great tudor window from which he could watch the drive the landscape was darkening without and the room was darkening within in a few minutes the servants would be coming with lamps and curtains would be drawn to shut out land and sky coralie poured out the tea and waited upon lady selina and mr coverdale the lady gave her plenty of work took two cups and a half of tea and played havoc with a dish of hot currant cake but the gentleman let his tea grow cold while he sat silently musing by the window ain't you cold over there mr coverdale so far from the fire asked cora thank you no he answered with a start and you haven't touched your tea let me give you a fresh cup you are very kind it really doesn't matter the lamps were brought in the curtains shut out sky and moor it was night now or seemed night mr coverdale rose with a sigh i'll take a turn on the terrace he said you keep this room rather too warm for me ladies with your splendid wood fires yes it's rather too like the tropical house at kew agreed coralie i'll go with you he smiled resignedly and made way for her to pass out of the door before him however much a man may wish to be alone with his own thoughts he can't say so when a lady charming or otherwise volunteers for society they went to the gravel walk in front of the castle a walk which commanded the carriage sweep they walked up and down briskly under the grey autumn sky but mr coverdale was no more conversational here than he had been in the drawing-room in vain did coralie start subjects which usually interested him he answered absently or he did not answer at all what a dreamer you are she exclaimed at last a man must dream however futile some of his dreams may be he answered quietly ah there is her ladyship's carriage what a quick ear you have don't you hear it yes i can hear it now but i didn't when you spoke i had not been listening so intently as you added cora significantly he did not notice the insinuation but walked quickly towards the carriage sweep 
and was standing at the foot of the stone steps ready to help lady penrith out of her carriage when it stopped i am very late she said apologetically but i have been a long way and you must be expiring for want of your tea exclaimed cora do come into the warm drawing-room and let me minister to you no thank you cora i have had tea and am very warm in this fur coat mr coverdale would you mind taking a tr turn on the terrace with me before we go indoors i want a little serious talk with you coralie stared aghast with her growing suspicions about john coverdale this seemed extraordinary conduct on her aunt's part and i should be in the way if i stayed she said pertly for this one occasion yes cora then i retire as gracefully as i can but i hope you'll change your mind aunt and let me order some fresh tea to be ready when you come indoors please no don't trouble about me i shall go straight to my room lady penrith and mr coverdale walked nearly to the end of the terrace before the silence was broken and then sibyl opened her heart to this anglican priest fearlessly and told him the story of those eventful months before lord penrith appeared upon the scene as her suitor i know you are the soul of honour she said and you are a priest i can confide in you i can ask you to help me as i dare not ask my husband although all that i am telling you to-night is known to him all except the events of last month of which he knows nothing you will help me won't you mr coverdale with all my heart and mind he answered with an earnestness which she could not mistake she told him every detail of that night in the village jail how she had allowed urquhart to act upon her fears and how she had urged brandon mountford to escape was i wrong she asked was i his enemy rather than his friend in my view of the case he should have stayed to face his accusers he should not have allowed himself to be persuaded oh it was my fault i was made to believe that i was saving him from death or at least from lifelong misery and shame and i sent him to his death or or to wretchedness worse than death and then she told him of that pencil scrawl and her interpretation of it and of the scene with the vicar's wife and daughter that afternoon that this unknown inmate of the vicarage was brandon mountford seemed to mr coverdale the wildest and most romantic of fancies on the other hand that pencilled appeal in a handwriting which lady penrith recognized as mountford's had to be accounted for and then place and time agreed the stormy sea the coming of the unknown lodger in the early morning the hidden life with its studied seclusion these facts pointed to some guilty secret and any man to whom these facts became known was bound in honour to investigate them had john coverdale lighted upon such a mystery in his own parish he would not have rested till he had unearthed the evil-doers his mission was to carry light into dark places you may be mistaken as to the identity of this person he said after a thoughtful pause but there can be no doubt it is a case for investigation i have heard something of mr carpew's character and antecedents which make me inclined to think he might lend himself to a villainous scheme if it were made worth his while i am going to st jude's to-morrow directly after breakfast 
Will you go with me, Mr. Coverdale? Certainly. It is the very thing I was going to propose. Let me be with you, and it shall go hard if we don't succeed in seeing this poor gentleman. Yes, yes, with your help I must succeed. How good you are good when it is such happiness to serve you she did not notice the earnestness of his tone in that one instant of self-betrayal did not notice how the cold grave manner changed suddenly to warmest feeling only to lapse again into that thoughtful calm which was his distinguishing characteristic with theo at my side i shall be strong she said I felt so weak and helpless to-day, so easily baffled by that shifty woman. I did not know what I ought to do, whether I ought to insist upon waiting for her husband's return. It seemed so feeble in me to leave that house, convinced as I was that Brandon was there, so near me, and in such bitter need of me. But you can help him you can release him from bondage they won't be able to trick you there is one thing to be remembered lady penrith a terrible accusation hangs over this man's head if he is the man you think and for him to reappear in the neighborhood will be to reopen that old story let it be reopened i would risk that let him face the accusation as he would have done in the beginning but for me i know that he was innocent that it was another hand that killed my adopted sister whom do you suspect i cannot tell you yet i may trust you even with that suspicion by and by no i would not fear for brandon to face his accusers new evidence would come to light perhaps if the history of that night were gone into coldly quietly the facts sifted and weighed as they could not be a few hours after the tragedy when every one was bewildered with the horror of that poor girl's death i know that he was innocent and if he is living hidden in st jude's vicarage you would risk the consequences of removing him, the almost inevitable reopening of the inquiry? Yes, I would risk that. So be it, Lady Penrith. Then you and I will tackle the vicar tomorrow morning, or, if he be out of the way when we call, we will make things so unpleasant for him that he won't be able to evade us very long you think he may not see us to-morrow i think if he is the scoundrel you believe him to be he may find some excuse for not receiving us sibyl breathed a despairing sigh oh how difficult it is to right a wrong she exclaimed lady penrith and mr coverdale drove away from the castle before ten o'clock next morning in the lady's barouche with a pair of horses that made light work of the distance and hilly roads the shooters had set out before the barouche drove up to the front of the castle and there were only lady selina and miss urquhart at home to wonder at this strange proceeding coralie ran out to the steps to watch the departure oh what a delicious morning she cried how fresh and crisp the air feels and then as with a sudden impulse do let me go with you aunt not to-day cora i am taking mr coverdale to see some poor people you would only be bored no no i wouldn't i am positively longing for a drive then gratify your longing you have not driven your own particular pony for ever so long I hate driving myself. I like to enjoy the air and the landscape. Then get a groom to drive you, said Sybil curtly, and the barouche drove off, leaving Cora standing at the top of the steps, discomfited. Now, 
what in the name of all that's ridiculous does this mean she asked herself can it be that the sage the calm the ineffable lady penrith is carrying on a flirtation with this pious parson under all our noses i know that he is in love with her the creature has not even the art to conceal his emotions she ran upstairs to her own cosy den and wrote her account of lady penrith's strange conduct of this morning for transmission to german street all compunction that she had felt in the beginning when the office of spy was first proposed to her had died out of her crooked little mind and now that lady penrith's influence was spoiling her chances of a great match gratitude to the benefactress who had redeemed her from bondage was a thing of the past what frauds these icily beautiful women are she said to herself as she folded the closely written sheet which occupied her for nearly an hour and then opening her secret volume she relieved her mind by scribbling ideas and feelings which she would have imparted to no living confidant life at the castle was growing lonelier and duller the smart soldier who frankly admired her sharp sayings and gave her a nightly lesson in billiards was to leave that afternoon and a keswick squire had left the day before the house party after to-day's luncheon would be reduced to lady selina and mr coverdale whose holiday from parish cares was being stretched longer than he had intended his parish was at the east end of london where he lived a life which would have been self-sacrifice for the son of the poorest commoner and where he was generally known to all the overworked mothers and to all the dirty little children as father coverdale End of chapter 23